Coming up on Inside the NRL, we begin the build-up to State of Origin 2. Maroon selector Darren Lockyer joins us live to reveal why 19-year-old rookie Reese Walsh was selected to help save Queensland. Will the Blues' Kingscliff switch help or hinder New South Wales? We hear from Blues coach Brad Fittler. And Kevy says it's time for a restructure at Red Hill. How long will it take to rebuild Brisbane? And is there any chance Wayne Bennett ends up back at the Broncos? Hello and welcome to Inside the NRL. A big week on the rep front. The NRL players, most of them have the week off, but it's origin for men and women this weekend. The women's match on Friday night. Then the men's on Sunday at Suncorp Stadium. We'll get Darren Lockyer on for a chat shortly. Uh, welcome Jamie Soward and Michael Chamis. Uh, a big weekend of footy just gone. Yeah, huge. And considering going into origin, it's always a bit of a tough one for those guys that are getting ready to go into camp. But I felt like yeah, the two teams at the top of the ladder just made more statements about how good they are. No egg on the face this week from Michael or Jamie. Instead, we all had beanies on our heads because it was beanie for brain cancer round in the NRL. And how good are these numbers? A record $4.1 million raise for the Mark Hughes Foundation. 160,000 beanies sold. $73,000 for 73 tries raised. That's thanks to Sportsbet. $105,000 raised from the big three trekkers who walked 150 kilometres from Sydney all the way to Newcastle across the week. And I've spoken to the Mark Hughes Foundation. They are absolutely overwhelmed. Their target was $3 million. But as I said, $4.1 million. Thank you to each and every one of you that bought a beanie across the weekend. There are some still available at the Mark Hughes Foundation website. That's markhughesfoundation.com. Au. We will get Darren Lockyer on for a chat uh, right now because there's some big breaking news when it comes to the Brisbane Broncos after their 46-0 loss to the Rabbitohs. Darren, uh, you're a Channel 9 analyst, you're a former captain of your state and the Broncos. Uh, the big news this afternoon is that Ben Iken has been appointed the head of football. Can you please confirm that news? Well, I wouldn't say the signature's on the contract yet, but it's looking very likely uh, that Ben will join the club. Uh, you know, he's he's a premiership winner as a player at the club. He's obviously um, seen the NRL work in all the different clubs with his role on um, 360. So he, he knows how the game works and he knows what structures and what I guess um, businesses are successful in the NRL and, and hopefully that expertise that he's got, and I, and I know him, I know him well, he's a good, uh, solid person, he's honest uh, and he's, you know, he's, got a, he's got a great concept of the game, so I think he would be a great addition. Darren, a lot of people in the game and outside the game are saying this is a great appointment for the Broncos after a couple of, of lean years. Now, Ben Iken went for the CEO's job in the off-season. Can you talk about what you saw in him in regards to that role and why he suits this role much better? Well, I think Dave, just, you know, I think Dave Donahue was a standout candidate. Um, so, you know, Ben, uh, I would say, wasn't far behind Dave, but it was just Dave presented so well and he's made a good impression since he's, since he's come there. And, you know, one of the challenges for the club over the last six to nine months has been that Dave wasn't able to come to us when we really wanted and needed him. Um, so uh, he's here now and he's had a good look at the, the structure of the, the football department. He's had a good look at the people in there. And as you can see, there are changes being made um, as we as we speak. Darren, how long were the club was the club in discussions with Ben for, given you know you only lost to the Rabbitohs a couple of days ago, there was talk across the weekend from Dave and both Kevy that the club needed a restructure, and a couple of days later, Ben has been appointed? Well, you, it's probably a question for Dave Donahue, really. I mean, you know, he's a CEO and he's in charge of um, you know, hiring the new people coming into the business. And I would say if you are, Dave has been talking to Ben for, for, for a little while now, but... You know, once the the trigger was pulled on on some of these decisions, uh, you know, it's it's probably in the best interest of the, of the playing group, in, in the best interest of the club, to get this transition done as quick as possible. But bear in mind, you want to get make sure you get the right people. So if you have to wait for the right people, then we'll wait. 
Darren, a new head of football. We, we spoke last week in regards to Tavita Pangai Jr.'s future. He's been told he's free to look elsewhere. So it's clear there's movement at the club. What about all this talk about Wayne, Barrett, Wayne Bennett coming back? Is that a possibility at all, whether it's a coach or a consultant? Have, is there any discussions in the last week in regards to Wayne Bennett and his potential involvement going forward? At the end of the day, what the, the board's charter is to do what's best for the club. Um, the business is in a really strong position. Obviously, the missing component is the on-field performance. And, you know, I, I don't think that you can just, you know, because of the history with um, with Wayne at the club, I guess obviously there's a successful part of the, um, the history and there's obviously the, the way, um, you know, he left the club the last time. But, you know, I, don't, I think you, if you put all that behind you and just focus on what you think is best for the club, well, I mean, you, you just go out there and look for the best people that's capable of doing the job for the club. Darren, one final one on the Broncos and the current situation there. We've heard restructure, we've heard rebuild. For the Broncos fans, how long will this restructure and rebuild take? Because this is the start, I guess, of many puzzles, uh, pieces that need to fit into the puzzle. Well, you know, obviously, if you look short term, we want to get you know better performances, um, better efforts from from all the players. Um, you know, obviously, confidence is a big part of that. So, look, I think this year, you know, it is about. Um, now, you know, looking to the future and finding those those players we think are a part of the long-term future of the club and and putting our resources and time into them. Um, so there is, there's going to be some movement in the playing roster. Um, it, it happens with any coach that comes to a club. They have different opinions and different thoughts on the roster. So that takes time to, to evolve and land where the current coach wants us to be. Um, but obviously, if you could do it, Sooner than you, you know, rather than later, that, that's ideal. But it doesn't always work out that way um, in the NRL. Darren, we thank you uh, for talking all things Broncos. But as we said, it's time to talk Origin 2 this Sunday. The Queenslanders will try and keep the series alive at Suncorp Stadium. Let's take a look at the two teams quickly that were named over the last 24 hours. Paul Green has named the team he believes can keep the series alive. The biggest talking point surrounds their number one, with Caelan Ponga ruled out again. Reese Walsh will make his Origin debut. Valentine Holmes moves to the wing with Xavier Coates dropped. Andrew McCulloch is back in Maroon for the first time since 2018. He replaces the injured Harry Grant who was ruled out this morning following a recurrence of his hamstring issue. Josh Papali'i returns from suspension while David Fafita has been dropped to the bench. Ben Hunt is the new utility option with Francis Molo named to make his origin debut. Now to the Blues. Just the one force change. Jay Trebojevic is out with a hip problem. So Junior Paulo starts a prop. Angus Crichton is the fresh face on Freddie's bench after serving his suspension. And Dale Finucane is is the new man on the Blues in the Blues 21-man squad. Uh, Darren, seven games into his NRL career, just 19 years of age. Why is Reese Walsh, or why has he been handed his Origin debut? Oh, look, I think it's just his it's uh, his talents. Obviously, you know we can all see that. Um, he, he's got great vision in attack, and he's got an ability to get the ball to his outside man with some space. So, you know, I think. I know defence was our big issue in game one, but we only, you know, we only scored uh, the one try. And, and if we want to, I guess, have, uh, I guess, a more expansive game, which we would have had if, you know, I guess, Caelan Ponga was available. Um, you know, enough, Val, I thought, played well in game one. But in terms of that skill set that allows, you know, seeing something and seeing an opportunity and getting the ball to those men in space, then we think that Reese Walsh is best equipped for that. Lockie, you can talk about Reese Walsh and how much he's going to improve the side, but it really comes down to the forwards. What did you make of their performance in Game 1? They never really asserted their dominance. New South Wales rolled down the field pretty easily all game. Yeah, I mean, that's the big focus. And, yeah, that's probably the reason why Andrew McCulloch's got to start. Um, you know, Josh Papali comes back. Uh, you know, we, we need to win the middle um, because if you don't win the middle, then guys like, you know, Turbo, Latrell Mitchell, Tedesco, they just have a field day, which they did in game one. So we know that the game is won and lost up front. So, you know, you can sort of dissect or analyse all the stuff that went on out wide. But until we fix the middle, we, we won't fix out there. Is that why Paul Green's gone for Dave Fafita off the bench and Jai Arrow, a better defensive player, a guy who knows how to get himself into the game to come off the bench? I think that's part of it. I mean, the, 
game one was the first time David's ever started in, in the starting position for Origin. So, you know, he's still, he's still pretty young. And I think sometimes that the intensity at the start of an Origin some, somewhat dilutes his impact. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I think coming off the bench, uh, you know, with, with his ability to be able to break tackles and come in fresh when maybe the sting's gone out of the game, I think that, that makes us look more dangerous. Lockie, with your Queensland hat on, obviously Reese Walsh's selection is uh, fantastic for the 18-year-old. With your Broncos hat on, uh, how does it feel 10 weeks ago in your development squad, he moves on to the Warriors and, and here he is in origin all of a sudden? Oh, it hurts. It hurts. There's no doubt. I mean, we, we knew he was pretty special talent. Um, you know, but Kevy was also, you know, he, he took into consideration, you know, he didn't want to throw him in too early. Now, I know we're talking about <laughs> throwing him in at a young age at Queensland, um, but... You know, in that sort of time where you know, Kevin wanted, I guess, probably protect him a bit and, and, and sort of you know, bring him into first grade at a at a, um, a pace that, um, you know, was, I guess, it was more about protecting Reese more than anything. Um, yeah, but Reese obviously felt like he, he had a, an opportunity to go to the Warriors and start straight away. And look, the rest is history, you know, and it's great to see him doing what he's doing. Um, I'd love to get him back to the Broncos one day. <laughs> Lockie, if you're standing just before moments before running out of Suncourt with the series on the line as captain, what are you saying to this group who got beat 50 points to six a couple of weeks ago? Oh, look, it's, it's one thing when you get beat to just use words to say you're going to play better. It's about actions, and it's about actions on a daily basis. Um, and I know, you know from experience that if, you, if you're willing to sacrifice and make you know, talk with your actions every, all day, Every, every day of the week in that camp, then you'll get a performance. Now, that performance might not be good enough, but I think you owe it to yourselves and you owe it to your state that you do everything you can possible in your preparation to get yourself ready for a performance on Sunday night. Darren, given the performances of Latrell Mitchell and Tom Trebojevic, how they dominated the edges, how much consideration was given to changing the Maroons' centre pairing for this match? Yeah, I think if you look at Dane, he's played his best football on the right uh, at origin level and he's, you know, a lot of it's been on the wing. Um, I think he was pretty keen to mark up on his on his South teammate in Latrell Mitchell. Uh, but again, you know, I thought Luke Capewell, sorry, Kurt Capewell, um, you know, other than the first try that Turbo scored, um, you know, he had, a, he had a pretty solid night. I mean, Turbo did a lot of his damage away from that, that, that right centre position. He just roamed like a fullback, but like he does for Manly, and he just popped up everywhere. So I don't think, I think Kate Well can do the assignment. Um, but again, if we don't, if we don't win the middle, um, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. If even, you know, for the best defensive centres in the games, it's a huge challenge marking against a, a Tom Travoyevich or a Terrell Mitchell with, with um, them running at you and you're on the back foot. Darren, during Queensland's golden run, a lot of talk, the criticism of New South Wales was the fact they always tried to pick sides to, to stop Queensland. They were always worried about stopping Queensland. Did you find yourself in a similar situation this time with the, the threatening, uh, the Arsenal they possess an attack with New South Wales, trying to do the same thing, figuring out ways to stop them? Oh, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I mean, it, it's five changes, but it's really only four because Papa Lee comes in, he would have been in game one, obviously, um, and we, you know, our focus first and foremost will be that middle of the field. And, you know, you got um, Andrew McCulloch, you got Tino, you've got, um, you know, um, you've got uh, Arrow on one edge and you've got Kafusi on the other edge and Christian Welsh. So he was a big out once he got, once he left the field in game one. So we're, we're confident that they, they can do the job that's required in the middle. Um so that's, you know, they know the, the, the task or the job in front of them. And then, you know, the guys coming off the bench like Dave and Mo, uh, those guys, you know, they, they, they can bring some impact. Your Maroons have won 13 of the last 15 matches at Suncorp Stadium. How much does it boost their chances of winning this match, given it's played at the Cauldron in front of, what, 40, 50,000 screaming Queenslanders? Well, there's no doubt it's a small advantage. But in saying that, we thought Townsville would be too. Uh, the <laughs> scoreline there, um, and I, I know the Blues will use it as motivation. Um, but you know, if, as a Queenslander, um, there's no better feeling than running out onto Suncorp and singing that national anthem. 
uh, it does give you, it, it does give you, uh, you know, that the goosebumps on the back of the neck and it, it gets you ready for a, for a contest. And the crowd obviously have, you know, they, 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 um, they help you out when you need it most, but we can't rely on them um, to win the football match. So it's good to be home, but we've still got a big job in front of us. Darren, as always, thank you so much for joining us on Inside the NRL, especially on a big day for the Broncos with that news about Ben Eichen fresh off the press. My pleasure, guys. See you on Sunday. Best of luck to those Maroons. Of course, uh, that match on Sunday, we'll get to... Uh, what were we going to say? The dream crusher. <laughs> I played in his last Origin game. He resold me. I played in the last Broncos game. He kicked the field goal. Broken cheekbone. <laughs> We've just got, uh, there. He's a big grin still on his face. He, I, I didn't know you mean it round. Still there. You still gee that up. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't realise that. But, uh, oh, I for did. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us, uh, Lockie. Uh, um, let's turn our attention to the Blues. Uh, one force change. No Jake Trebojevic. Junior Paulo will start. But one of their strengths in game one was a one-two punch of Paulo and Payne Haas off the bench. Do you like the balance of this forward pack in the middles better or worse than game one? I think, look, game one was obviously perfect for New South Wales. I actually thought Jake Trebojevic was going to start off the bench. Uh, I don't know if Freddie's locked into that side, to be honest. Dale can maybe a late change, potentially, uh, depending on how the game goes. But they have got their work cut out from. Looking at that Queensland side, I actually think it's a better Queensland side than game one. Yeah, they've got a little bit more balance. Fafita coming off the bench is a bit more of a weapon. But the New South Wales outside backs are just, they're in form, they're strong, they're big. And the way that they played, the completion rate, they were disciplined in defence. Yeah, this is a huge chance for, yeah, Michael talks about the dynasty with Lockie and stuff like that. It's a huge chance for them to make their own history and start something especially for New South Wales. We thought it was going to be three in a row last year. Uh, it didn't work out, but hopefully this year they get the job done. All right, the COVID-19 outbreak in Sydney means the Blues have had to relocate from Sydney to Kingscliff on the New South Wales north coast. Here's what Brad Fittler had to say about their move north. Well, not from the players' point of view. The, it, was sort of, it was challenging for some of the other staff to obviously flights and accommodation and it's all pretty hard to get accommodation. School holidays are coming up, so there were challenges, but not from a playing point of view. or That won't have anything to do with the way we play or there's absolutely nil excuses. I'm sure most of the Blues uh, players are happy they're heading north, Michael, but do you think this will help or hinder their preparation? No, oh, look, I don't think it makes a difference, to be honest with you. These players are used to it. They've been in camps environments before. They go away a lot for, for their clubs. Like last year, they were flying in and out on game day for given the COVID restrictions. So they're used to disruptions. They're used to different environments. I don't think it affects them one way or another. But uh, look, uh, one, one thing that we saw in Townsville that is a dry track definitely suited the, the way they wanted to play and not sure what the conditions are forecast for Sunday in Brisbane, but you'd imagine if it's a dry track, it plays into their hands yet again. In the past two years, Sowie, we've seen the Blues have two big wins, and then they've almost choked the next game. In, in 2019, James Tedesco won the buzzer, got them home in a series. Mm -hmm. They lost in Game 3 last year. Is it the Maroons' bounce-back factor? Is it complacency? What do the Blues have to be wary of this time around and make sure they're not embarrassed at Suncorp again? It won't be complacency. I think that it'll be the bounce-back factor. As I said, you know that Queensland side looks a lot more dangerous to me. You talk about Christian Welch, he'll get more time in the middle uh, you know, with the HIA. And then you have a look at you know, Josh Papali'i coming back into the side. So that first 20 minutes, I remember going up there, Games 1 and 3 in 2011, and you know, we focused our energy on that first 20 minutes and felt like it didn't have to be 6-0 our way, but it just couldn't be 6 or 10 nil their way and, and we felt like we we're going to be in the game and yeah game one we almost stole it at the death but uh, it, game three it was out of our hands because the first 20 minutes they blew us away. You've played in dominant teams before not in obviously with your club side with the Dragons I think you won back to back minor premierships do you get to a point where you know that if you play anywhere near your best football you can't lose is, is that where New South Wales are right now that if they just deliver to what their potential is they've got the series? Yes. Yeah, Wayne spoke about it at half time of the grand final. That's not the Dragons out there knowing how good our game was when we were fully on. So they'll still have to do the little things. They'll have to control the middle. And But the outside backs for me is just a huge advantage. You know, the way that they played, the speediness around the ruck and the dry track as well. If it's dry, you know, I can see New South Wales putting on points. All right, you can catch Origin 2 live and exclusive on Channel 9. Darren Lockyer and the gang will be there from 7pm. That's live and ex exclusive on Channel 9. Now, we touched on the Broncos with Darren a short time ago. Ben Eichen, if you missed the news, will be their new head of football moving forward. But from a coaching perspective, Sowie, who's someone else that the Broncos need to bring in to help Kevin Walters? Because 
it doesn't stop here with one appointment. No, it doesn't. And you know, if you want, it depends where it all sits. I don't know the ins and outs of the board and stuff like that. But yeah, you, know, you need someone that you can lean on that's been there. And Wayne Bennett built that club. You know, along with a lot of great players as well. But it, they were rolling when he left and he brought those youngsters through. So um, I would have him there back at the club as a consultant to Kevy. He doesn't probably want to be in the coaching at Brisbane uh, with all the stuff that's going on. But if he was there as a sounding board to Kevy Walters, I think that, that could help him. Do you think that's what Wayne wants? Do you think Wayne will go back and play second fiddle? Well, he'd be top dog. Yeah, Kevy would still be answering to him in a, in a way. You know what you know what Wayne's like more than anyone here. Can he? No, he wouldn't. But the question was, would you know, who would you like to see go back yeah. there and help? Oh, him? there's no doubt Wayne Bennett will help them. I'm just wondering, does the dynamic there at the current, you know, with the way things are with Kevy and and let's be let's be honest at the moment, he's probably in a situation where he's trying to find find his feet as an NRL coach. So to have someone of Wayne's ill come in there, do you, do you start to feel threatened? Do you start to second guess yourself? These are all things that the Broncos have to consider because the dynamic there is going to be important going forward. And especially if Wayne's only there for 12 months and he gets appointed as the head coach of the, the Brisbane expansion team, if that's the way the NRL heads, then they're in a situation where you could have the coach coming in for a little period who's about to take your roster with you and they'll be in their ear. So these are all things they have to consider at the moment. And uh, it's 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 a long road ahead. I, I don't think Brisbane have a short road to success nah. again. Well, just with that in mind, Kevin Walters is only signed until the end of next year. So it's not like he's on a long-term deal either. So well, if, the, if, if they're going to undergo a restructure from top to tail in terms of their administration, which they've started in terms of rosters, telling Matt Lodge, Tavita Pangai Jr. they're right to go, I don't see the results turning around. But so what does that mean for Kevin Walters? Yeah, but I don't think any coach signs a contract these days. The five-year deals are, are gone. Yeah, you know, they learned the hard lessons last let's, time. Let's, let's talk Kevin. What yeah, does it mean the, for the, him? It means for him that he's got to show some improvement next year because they've gotten worse this year. Yeah, if, if this was the second year of the contract, there's no way that they could renew that contract. If Wayne Bennett has any ambition to coach, and I'm sure he does, then he can't go in under Kevin Walters with one year to go because Wayne Bennett will want that job. Is that, is that not fair to say? He would love to go back to Brisbane and save him. So I, I just don't see the dynamic between Kevy and Wayne sharing that responsibility. Well, we, uh, yeah. It, it, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that Wayne's going to undermine him or any way, but naturally there is a thought there that Wayne can continue as coach. And if he's going in there to be the consultant to Kevy, I don't think it's going to end well. Well, every time Wayne Bennett walks back into Suncorp Stadium, he's asked about his future at the club. That was certainly the case after his Rabbitohs beat the Broncos on Thursday night. How do you feel about the state the Broncos are in and what, what do you make of it? You haven't got enough time for me to tell you, so move on. Do you think he can turn it around, Wayne, uh, Kevin? I think he's got the tools here to do it. Next question. Any advice for Kevin? Pardon? Any advice for Kevin? No advice. Struggle with yourself. Yes. So is there anything, Michael, that Wayne Bennett knows that we don't? Or is he just playing everyone? I think he's waiting for the phone call. I think he's waiting for the call that says, come back and save us. And Will he get it, it might happen. It might happen. Like, there's a long way to go in this season. And well, they need to make a decision, Brisbane, whether they want... If they're going to rip the Band-Aid off and they've got Ben Eichen in, who I think is one of the smartest football brains in the game to help turn the ship around, if, if you're sitting down at a table right now and you said, right... Kevy, would Wayne Bennett help you? And if he says no, then it won't be. But if he said yes, everyone else has to put their ego aside and bring in and turn around. Because like I've said before on this show, I've played with Broncos, ex-Broncos players who grew up wanting to only be Broncos. There's none of that anymore. No one wants to be a Bronco at the moment. They, they, they just don't want to go there. So they need whatever help they can get to help turn that ship around. All right, if it's not Wayne Bennett, who's the one man that can turn the club around? Whether it's a coaching director, whether it's the coach... Who's the one man? Because if Wayne says no, Trent Robinson's not leaving the Roosters anytime soon. Craig Bellamy said he doesn't want to coach beyond, was initially this year, his future with Melbourne. Well, you Craig Bellamy is you throw the kitchen sink at him. They've, they've thrown a few kitchen sinks at him and they haven't landed him yet. So I, I think Craig Bellamy is the obvious one. Um, but outside of Wayne Bennett going back there, which is the, that's the conundrum they're in at the, the moment, Broncos, is they probably know. And, and, and Lockie, we asked him earlier about that. And he sort of dodged the question a little bit and said, you know, we've got to forget all our history and whatever happened. We've got to do what's best for the club. I think it's on the cards. It's just got trying to work out how they just don't blow up the club in the process of it happening. And Ben Eichen will be given time to work out whether Kevy 
is the right man for the job. He's going in there in his first week and he's going to walk in into a, an avalanche of criticism from the outside about the club. So give him time to sort it out. And, and Wayne has said he doesn't want to stay in Sydney. He wants to head back to Brisbane. So they've got time. Up until the NRL decide whether there's an expansion team or not, the Broncos have time. Okay. Watch this space on the <laughs> Brisbane Broncos. It's time to check out this week's Casualty Ward brought to you by Chemist Warehouse. And as we discussed earlier, the biggest injury out of the weekend came out of the Storm camp with Harry Grant picking up a hamstring issue that ruled him out of Origin 2. And that wasn't it for Melbourne. Fellow hooker Brandon Smith had his night cut short over the weekend with a corked calf. Well, there were also issues for Remus Smith and Tom Eisenhuth. West Tigers forward Sean Bloor will await scans on an ankle injury. Adam Elliott looks set to be on the sidelines for a while. Reports suggesting the Bulldogs forward may have suffered a cheekbone fracture. Luckless Eels hooker Nathaniel Roach appears to have unfortunately suffered another knee injury. He came off with a dislocated kneecap after 23 minutes on Sunday. Sebastian Chris passed his HIA on Saturday night but sustained an eye injury that ended his match against the Dragons. Kurt Mann left the field in the second half of their win over the Warriors with an ankle concern. And there were a number of head knocks out of round 15 with Bailey Sirenen, Jesse Arthurs and Mark Nichols among the players to fail HIAs. This year's uh, Women's State of Origin match will take place on Friday night at Sunshine Coast Stadium. Kickoff is at 7.45pm. Let's take a look at the two teams that have been selected for this match. It's always a cracking contest between the best women in the country. The Maroons first. They could blood five new rookies, among them teenagers Tiana Rafstrand-Smith and Destiny Brill, who have earned call-ups after strong form in the Harvey Norman National Championships last month. Experience forwards, Talisha Harden and Rona Peters, are g doing everything possible to be late inclusions after they were named in 18 and 19 jerseys. Maroons coach, Tani Norris, is set to make a call on their fitness later in the week. If Harden and Peters don't play, Queensland will have 19 games of origin experience compared to New South Wales 31. The Blues have named two debutants of their own with Kennedy Sherrington and Keely Davis set to make their origin debuts. Maddie Studden returns to the halves. She'll line up alongside Corbin Baxter, formerly McGregor. There's two slight injury concerns for the Blues. Beau Vede Walsh and Millie Boyle have been on light duties but are expected to play Sowie. Eight of those 19 uh, Maroons players uh, won the BHP Premiership in Queensland. Their competition equivalent to New South Wales uh, playing for Burley. Their coach is also the Maroons coach. So what does that combination do given they've only got 10 days together in the lead up to arguably the biggest match of the year for them. Yeah, well, it is the biggest match of the year uh, until the NRLW season rolls around, but that's a bit more individualised. Look, that's an impressive side that Queensland have rolled out. You think about Taryn Aitken. She took the competition by storm last year. Tamika Upton, her speed in and around the ruck, she turns those half opportunities into tries. So they're going to be dangerous, you know, this Queensland side, and they were impressive in beating, um, you know, the... the side that Ali Brigginshaw's in. You know, her role in the middle of playing in 13s obviously changed the way that we sort of view that halfback in the women's game. She can go in there and be a link like Isaiah Yeo does for the Blues. So they'll be very hard to beat up there. We spoke to um, New South Wales Blues assistant coach Jeff Tuvey on Triple M on the weekend and he was. I asked him about Maddie Studden and obviously left out last year, started the year before. She was a standout in the City Country game. What do you make of that selection and how much will the pain of last year help Maddie this time around? I think the important thing for Maddie is she needs to get herself into the game mm -hmm. you know, straight away. And you know, she's got a running 5'8 and Corbin Baxter outsider. So she's got some big, powerful outside backs. The forwards are going to have to match the forwards of Queensland. But they do have the size and speed in the outside backs to be able to cause some damage. Her kicking game is going to be really important. I feel like the times that we've watched the Origin women's game, whoever kicks uh, the most and the best, yeah, much like the NRL, is, is usually on the front foot. So I'll be interested to see how Maddie starting attacks that. Look, she wasn't probably in great form heading up to that city country origin match, but she got played herself into the team. Origin advantage at home is huge. The Blues have won both games at North Sydney Oval. Queensland have won their last match at Sunshine Coast Stadium. The Blues also have to travel. They're in camp mm. a shorter time. Michael, do you think that will have an influence on their chances? Oh, too big well, history, su history suggests you know, the, the home ground advantage for New South Wales the first two years at North Sydney, you know, they won both games. So you'd imagine, like the Men's Origin Series, it'd be, it plays some sort of factor, but no, look, like, this is a pretty even one, Sally, that all the things that you mentioned there. I, I, I think, look, I think the, the situation with Origin is the conditions and this type of football they play. And 
as I said to you earlier, I think Brisbane and the Sun, just Queensland in general suits the men. Who does this suit the way the both teams like to play? Probably Queensland, I would say. It suits them up there. Yeah, last year you saw how dominant they were. But, yeah, the key for New South Wales, if they can kick well through Studden and then Bovetti Welsh can inject herself into the back line, the outside backs get a chance, there might be a chance of an upset. And Friday night is an historic night for the women's game. For the first time ever, both coaches in the Origin Arena will be uh, women. So Tani Norris up against Kylie Hilda. What does that say about the growth of the game in recent years because it just seems to accelerate year on year. Yeah, I love it. And I spoke to Kylie Hilda at a New South Wales Rugby League function. She's really excited. She's got the help of a Premiership winner and a you know, great Origin player and Jeff Tuvey helping her as well. So I think it just goes to show how far the women's game has come. I'll be up there Friday night uh, calling the under-19s game and then a couple of cold ones hopefully watching New South Wales take the shield back. Uh, across the border. All right, and of course there are still a couple of tickets for Friday night's Women's Origin match at Sunshine Coast Stadium. You can get them at ticket, uh, nrl.com slash tickets. It's now time for Hit or Miss. First one, the Tigers have gone backwards in season 2021. Jamie Soward. Hit for me. Uh, and I'll, I'll put it, sum it up very, very quickly. The other week at Leichhardt, you know, we talk about the emotion levels playing at Leichhardt in Campbelltown. Tom Rudonica's weekend, they didn't turn up. They got spanked. You know, the other week they beat the Panthers and it felt like they'd played themselves into a top four position. Now, I had to check the ladder. They were still coming 10th. Um, since that, they haven't, something hasn't translated the last two performances. I called the game on the weekend. The first set of the game, when Brandon Smith scored, I said in commentary, I think this is going to be 50. They just did not look like they wanted to be there. You know, they just ran around. But look at this, Nelson and Sofa Solomon went to dummy half. What's he going to do, run? And he did. So um, I think they have gone backwards. They've slowly started to, a bit like the Broncos, make some changes. Tim Sheen's coming back in. Brett Kamali is doing their pathways. So, uh, But, yeah, you would have to say they've gone backwards. I mean, this was a team that was pushing for you know, the top eight last year. Michael? Mate, they've hit. They've gone backwards. They're on a treadmill. They're not moving their legs. They're flying off. They're gone. Seriously, this team, I thought they were going to be on the edge of the eight this year, the Tigers. And they were improving a few years ago under Ivan. And they've just gone backwards, not just this year. Each year that Michael Maguire has been there, they've gone worse and worse. And their squad's probably better than what it was last year. These guys that they've signed, the younger kids, they're actually doing a good job. Well, you wrote a column in your Sydney Morning Herald earlier this year. And you also sat here on Inside the NRL and said they've finally got it right in terms of their roster and recruitment. Was that the recruitment? I so think what, I said it was wrong. I yeah. said, I, their recru- I, I can't, look, Dane Laurie's been a great signing. So, so, okay, Stefano, so, so if they've got that right, what is going wrong? If they've got the recruitment right, what's gone wrong? Well, I don't think there are people there who are happy within the club, players, staff. I just think it's an unhappy club. And Unhappy with the head coach? Unhappy. Well, I've said that before and been criticised by Tigers fans. I just don't see the club getting the results that it desires at the moment. And I get the argument that it's the roster, it's the roster. But the roster's not, Im- it's improving to a point. But these are the young guys they're signing. Tell me a big name signing that, a, that Michael Maguire, a premiership winning coach, has been able to land for the West Tigers. Well, James no Tamo was big, but at the back yeah, end of his career. James Tamo was brought there for leadership. James Tamo was never going to change the club. Mm. Look, at, look at Trent Barrett. He signed Josh at O'Carr and he signed Matt Burton. They're two guys you can hang the, the, your hat off for the next year. You've got two big signings coming to the club to help turn it around. What have the Tigers done under Michael Maguire? I get it. They have to sign the young kids because they can't land the big fish. Everyone they've gone for are not interested. Now they're in for Tavita Pangor Jr. I'm pretty sure Tavita Pangor Jr. is going to be looking at other options before he takes this option with the Tigers. It, it's, they're in a point at the moment where some, I get it. There's head office and there's the, the roster. But everyone looks at the coach. And for some reason, everyone at that club looks uninspired at the moment. Who does that fall on, Sowie? I don't know. I answered my question. I well, the, the def- def- he's supposed to be a defensive orientated coach, and the defence is, is woeful. It's gone backwards. Okay, got to move on. The Titans roster is good enough for them to be playing play- in the playoffs at the end of this year. Oh, I'm going to say miss. I, I think there's an immaturity with the Titans. That was very hard to watch if you're Justin Holbrook, and I feel like we've said that every single week over the last month. Yeah, they're, they're probably the only team in the comp that could be down by 30, lead with a minute to go and, and get beat. Yeah, that's the way that, and then last week, up 24-8, they're up 22-0 against the Broncos. Like, it's immaturity. Yes, the game's faster, we get all that, but this is from the kickoff. I mean, the Titans, yeah, just immature. I don't think they've got enough guys and, and it happens, you know, there's clubs, they're not in the, only, the only one in the boat, but there's clubs out there that, you know, a lot of young kids don't know what 80 minutes looks like. 
Zach. The 80 minutes that I played is the 80 minutes different. that's way different now. So, um, yeah, no. Nah. Well, I don't understand why they haven't been active in the halves. Like, to me, they're just lacking. Who would you spirit. go after, though? Yeah, but they ha- the, the, the boat's it's sailed. It's gone. Like, Adam Reynolds was there for the taking. Did they have the money for Adam Reynolds? They got Adam... Um, See, because the club's like... like contract so for a million you, said dollars. Do- you said the dogs, right? Dogs and Titans both need number nine. They that's didn't. where it starts. The halves, the halves, yes, but the halves are at a premium at the moment. The competition is showing that you, know, you, you need a good number nine who understands his role, who understands the game. And those teams don't have it. That's why their results are mixed. Simply hit or miss. Miss. Sweet. Ricky Stewart illegally activated an 18th man and gave a debut to Xavier Savage when Sebastian Chris uh, was ruled out of their game against the Dragons. Uh, Jack Bird was not simbinned or sent off. He was put on report. Here's what Ricky Stewart had to say after the Raiders lost to the Dragons. I believe if you lose a man to foul play, you should be able to enact your 18th man. Regardless of whether it's a simbin or a sent off offence? Well, if he's put on report, yep, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, put on report, bin or sent off, I just believe it's a, if it's a foul play, you should be able to enact as long as you lose your man. So as it stands, the player has to be sent off or sin binned to enact the 18th man. But do you agree with Ricky's comments, hit. regardless of what happened to the opposition hit. player? Yeah, hit, because you lose a player. Now, there's an independent doctor that will go out there and, and obviously see if it's a head knock. You know, that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about you know, if you fall over and hurt yourself, you have to play a man short. But if you come in for a head knock, which... You know, Sebastian Chris copped off Jack Bird, which was nothing, you know, then for me, yeah, you should be able to replace that player. Michael? Yeah, if they fail the HIA. Yeah, if they come back on the field, then no. That's, uh... If a penalty is given, they may, that means there's been foul play of some state. All right? Now, everything gets put on report these days. So f- if you lose a play, you should be able to replace that player. Yeah. No, I'm not convinced. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, no fence sitting here. Hit or miss? Miss. Thank you. Manly's second half against the Titans was better than the Storm's first half against the West Tigers. Hit or miss, Sowie? Oh, good <laughs> question. Uh, Manly's second miss, half better. Miss. The Melbourne Storm's execution in that first half, outstanding. Everything was out in front. They were just red hot. Michael? Yeah, I'm, I'm with Sowie. And you can't reward Manly for falling behind by far. You know, just there's just an asterisk next to him. So yeah, we'll tough. Go Nine tries and Manly don't get home. How, how does, listen, I call this game, right? Ten different try scorers. The record's 11. Uh, St George beat Canterbury 91-6 back in 60 years ago. Josh Adokar didn't score a try. Did, did either what are you doing, the Fox? <laughs> yeah, George Jennings scored one, I oh, think. There you go. All right, our final hit or miss. Roger Tuivasa-Shek's try saver against the Raiders earlier this year is still the number one try saver of the year ahead of Xavier Coates and Jaden Braley on the weekend. Miss. Xavier Coates on that try saver was unbelievable. The way he reeled him in. Roger coming across. Yeah. Xavier I'm, for me. I'm disagreeing. I'm going with Roger. Hit. Match on the line, dying seconds. He won't be able to do it anymore. He's playing the wing. Get him back to fullback. All right. That's um, uh, that's hit or miss done. Champ or chump? Yeah, champ or chump this week. Uh, my champ is Ruben Garrick. Uh, I think the way he's been playing the last couple of weeks, he's filled in for Tom Draboyevich. Scored four tries yesterday. Uh, easy, easy tries just off the back of Tommy, obviously turning it on. But I was really happy for him. You know, he's, he's put himself in line to get a new contract there at Manly. And like I said, he's been really valuable for them uh, going forward. OK, so he's your chump, uh, champ. Who's your chump? Yeah, my chump's Ruben Garrick. Um, had one of those days <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, poor old Ruben. He's a good sort. But I uh, had one of those days with the boot yesterday that was pretty awful. I think at one stage he was one from six. Uh, now, I've had those days. It's not nice, boys. But uh, in the end, he corrected it. But it was a pretty old, rough old day. You couldn't believe it. Look at some of these shots. He's just trying to nurse it over, just thinking, if I just get one, I'll be right. Push that one out wide. One from six he was at one stage, and they still won by 30. Could yeah. you imagine, though, they, they scored 48 points in the second half? Yeah, so they would have scored 60 points in the second half. Oh, and four he was. In 40 minutes. Incredible. And it still was worse than the Storm's first half against Way worse. the Tigers. That you don't get rewarded. That'll absolutely. <laughs> you don't get rewarded <laughs> for starting do. slow. We're done here. Quick prediction for Origin 2. Uh, New South Wales, 30 plus. 30 plus? New South Wales 31 plus man of the match. <laughs> Jerome Lewis. Right, I hope it heads to a decider. Game three in Sydney. Bring it on. Thanks so much for joining us on Inside the NRL. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Darren Lockyer, for joining us as well. Bring on Sunday and Friday, the women's origin on Friday night, then the men's on Sunday. Tune in for both of those.